we met in the 80s when uh, Max was first a graduate student mm -hmm. and then went on to work for uh, Tom Krenz at the Guggenheim. And he was about 23 and I was about 35. And we'd have dinner once in a while and talk about art. And it's a wonderful experience when you meet somebody at 23 and they turn out to become <laughs> director of the Metropolitan Museum, which is for all of us such a important institution. Oh. Well, thanks, Peter. It's, it's great to be here. And thank you for joining us, uh, for making it through the rain. Um, thanks to Karma Gallery for, of course, hosting this event and also the, the exhibition together with Craig Starr and, of course, the fantastic show that's right now at Mudam. Um, yes, when I got asked if, if I would like to do that conversation, I said I would love to. Uh, and indeed, it's because not only I'm a great admirer of Peter's work and I've followed Peter's work and we've actually did a show together in Frankfurt at the Schien Kunsthalle, um, which was uh, very important, powerful installation. Um, but it was really uh, Peter's generosity at the very beginning um, when I was indeed a graduate student. Um, and he was, of course, back then, one of the famous artists uh, of New York, or certainly someone. And I approached him because I was uh, writing my thesis on, in art history on, cont on the art market boom of the 1980s and how that kind of could kind of change, transform both reception as well as production. Uh, so it was looking at the market development from an art historical lens. And so I, uh, I, I asked Peter um, if he would speak to me and he was really uh, extremely generous, not only to, to invite me, but immediately connect me to a number of people and one of who is here, Chris Byrne, who has been the, the curator of this show. And I remember also Alan Schwartzman and Andrew Santos. It was great to kind of have an artist really care about what, so to see, a young generation might think. And probably also wanted to kind of know where they are in their thoughts. And I think that that's what makes a Peter, certainly was among other artists, but I think what makes Peter very special um, because he has a genuine interest uh, in other people's work, um, certainly was in other artists' work, not only because he references it in, in his own uh, work, but he writes about it. And for me, uh, it was actually also his writings uh, that were so important uh, and which also got published, but where Peter from the early 80s on was one of the most articulate artists, uh, really writing about art and writing about artists, which I think that uh, was uh, certainly outstanding. But then also I think that if you look at Index Magazine uh, that you started then in the 90s, which was really also about uh, not only creating a platform, uh, but also uh, kind of bringing people together. So it was really uh, Peter, and now I see Heim Steinbach over there, who has also been enormously uh, nice to welcome me back then and kind of bring, uh, bring me into the New York art world. And uh, so, I, so I'm very happy to be here and very, happy to experience uh, this, this talk. So obviously we want to talk about uh, Peter's work and I want to, mainly I want to have Peter talk. So I just wanted to have that quick intro. Um, now this show of course happens um, here at Karma Gallery on, on the Lower East Side, um, actually not far from where these works got done uh, or where you worked on them. So, I, I mean, I know you talked about it already in various ways, but I think it's important for this room, and since we are in this place, to kind of speak a little bit about um, how, uh, how life was for you in, the, in 1980, 1981, and how it was for you as an artist uh, working on the Lower East Side. Um, so maybe you could kind of uh, share a little bit of that as an intro to, uh, to when we kind of explore then this work and, and this time of it more. Sure. Um, I grew up in New York and was away for many years. And in the 70s, I lived in New Orleans and uh, returned to New York in 1980 and moved to a, a loft on East 7th Street between 1st and A. And uh, living here at first, I didn't know many people. I had to sort of 
readjust to uh, some family issues, uh, you know, psychologically, and also the uh, physical reality, the enormity of the uh, of New York as a metropolis, uh, almost struck me as if I were a newcomer. And uh, my first uh, uh, year or two in uh, New York, I sort of describe as a uh, as one of uh, existential isolation. Uh, these paintings are dark. Um, the, uh, the thematic was to wall up the space of the painting. Um, I was experimenting with uh, some other themes as well. But uh, one of the big influences at the time in 1980 for many young artists was uh, Philip Guston. And uh, at first glance, these may not looked like Gustin, but his own themes of sort of existential despair and his frontal space and uh, his, his uh, let's call it cartoon style, which in my case developed into a more diagrammatic style, was really a, a big influence on me. And uh, the other thing I was uh, wrestling with was uh, neo-expressionism, which was uh, uh, really coming into its own at the time, but I didn't feel very positively about it. Uh, to me, it was uh, nostalgic. There was a lot of, they had returned to traditional oil paint and brushwork. And uh, most of all, oh, and also the, the idea of, a, of, of the artist as a kind of virtuoso. And uh, so I began to think about minimalism and pop again. And one thing that I just always recoil from is the idea of artist as virtuoso. I prefer to see the artist as a, every person who somehow is interested in something and carries that out, but it's not a matter of who wields the, the, the brush or the materials better. Uh, so that is sort of the uh, background of this. Uh, this show at a Mudam in Luxembourg, curated uh, by Michelle Cotton, who I hope is here. Uh, well, I, anyway, I want to give a shout out to her because she's just become uh, director of the uh, uh, Kunsthalle in uh, Vienna, which is a very interesting institution. Uh, but the sh the, throughout most of the 80s, I was developing uh, the idea of the, sp the contemporary space that we live in is a series of compartmentalized units connected by linear conduits that were physically isolated uh, but connected by technology. But here in 1980, 1981, I wasn't, I was just pretty much feeling the isolation and compartmentalization and hadn't really, it hadn't really hit me, the idea of connection. Right. If you look at that, this work, and of course for, for some who know a bit of your later work, uh, this is clearly, um, it, it's, more, it's more dark, it's more isolated, it's more austere, it is certainly also even more confined uh, than uh, So do you feel that when you worked on this, was it, uh, like your your own so to say own perception of your own so to say isolation within the city of New York and you as a newcomer, or were you trying to also really try to kind of set a very radical, austere counterpoint to the expressive, more maybe more colorful uh, work of Julian Schnabel and Francesco Clemente and the uh, whole Trans Vanguardia there. So, what, you know. I'm sure it was both, but kind of what was it kind of really your, when you speak about isolation and you, you speak about that a lot at the beginning of your time here in mm -hmm. New York, I mean, was it a kind of a, a, an individual isolation that you felt or was it an artistic isolation that you wanted to kind of isolate you, yourself from what was going on, almost like retreating so that you can uh, position a counterpoint? Well, or was it sort of a very kind of uh, conscious way of uh, uh, placing that work in that context? It's a, it's a very good question. I don't think the two can be separated. Right. But I, they, the, these paintings were 
certainly painted in a simple, straightforward um, uh, workmanship-like way. Um, these were mostly hand painted, but by 81, I had begun to um, uh, try to uh, give up the hand and uh, use more commercial materials and uh, 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 shapes, uh, geometric shapes that were uh, taped off and painted very flatly. Uh, sometimes I think uh, people might get the impression that I decided to paint prisons and where did that come from? But here in 81, I'm experimenting with a wall and then mm -hmm. I decided that, well, the wall could have a window in it and become prison. And then the idea that the prison didn't have a background anymore. Uh, so the painting itself became a prison. Uh, the pink triangle was a um, holdover from figures, from representation of a figure in my earlier work. The ones behind you are uh, apartment houses. And I was playing around with the minimalist grid, of course. Uh, but it's nice to show early work because that didn't go anywhere uh, <laughs> right. after 81. And I hope you'll have a chance to uh, look at the drawings because uh, there's uh, a kind of uh, dry humor involved. Uh, the one on the far right has a movie theater, airplane seats, a parking lot, and this idea that we're all always arranged as we are today in lined up seats and constricted spaces was mm. important to me. When you, I think what's also already clear in the drawings, but of course, yeah, I mean, like in a certain way, you have a, there's a micro aspect of this work, but then also this is clearly also work that reflects to a certain extent also New York and or, or, let's see, a, a grid-like metropolis like New York with all the, the, its connotations. And so, I, I mean, and you are on the one hand certainly seen, and you are right, so one of the, like, one of the New York artists uh, and uh, deeply rooted also within the New York uh, scene, but maybe you could speak a little bit also about what your relationship was with New York uh, back then. I mean, in the sense that uh, you have the, on the one hand, the, the grid, like you see that the, the city kind of probably kind of um, was like pressuring you, um, and on the other hand, you you use it as a as a uh, as a metaphor uh, for 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 your work, and kind of and out of that, you kind of develop a vocabulary that basically yes, kind of describes geometry as something entirely not abstract, but uh, very much socially and politically charged. We can yes. talk then about the theoretical underpinnings of that. But I think it's even like, if you're in New York and you understand the way grid like uh, structure, it kind of immediately becomes obvious uh, for that. So, uh, like how, how did you feel about New York as a city and how, how that reflects in your work in that, at, during that time? Well, uh, even though I'd grown up here, all of a sudden it occurred to me that it's not only a grid, it's a three-dimensional or four-dimensional Cartesian grid. It's, mm -hmm. all, it's all right angles going not only horizontally, but up and down. And just the, the action of leaving the gallery and going down the street and going down to the subway and along another line and to somebody else's house and up on an elevator, that the movement along that Cartesian grid uh, fascinated me. The upper left drawing is called uh, Ideal City. And at the same time, and this comes a little bit later, but it also seemed like a, the physical experience of the kind of space that was developing in the digital world, which is hyper-Cartesian. And uh, so there was a certain um, uh, blend in my mind between the physical space of New York and uh, uh, and uh, the logic of digital mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. When you talk about digital, I mean, of course, uh, you are seen as, so to see, a, a, an absolute, I mean, your work is being seen also as an absolute seismograph of what we are, what we are experiencing later on in living within a, 
digitally expansive, but on, uh, in the same way confined uh, world. Um, and it's obviously that the from the from the prisons here, then to the cells, to the conduits, there's a, there's a very strong connotation uh, there. And I also always try to kind of go back, to, since we are here, uh, really seeing work that uh, is very rarely seen, actually, of the very early, early this work that you have, is that what was your, were you, were you interested, actually, back then in computers? Uh, or, or was it just something that you kind of sensed around? Or, I mean, did you even, Interact, so to say, with with, with, uh, with the digital world at that time, which of course was still a, not that yet that developed environment. Or was there an, a general interest of yours there? Well, I read a lot about it. Yeah. And um, back in the seventies, there were mm -hmm. uh, already ATM machines, <laughs> and the fact that you could put a piece of plastic in a machine and money could come out. <laughs> mm -hmm. I never quite figured out how they did it, but. That was already a, a very sophisticated uh, digital system. Mm -hmm. And there was also uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, writing and theorizing that was beginning to come out about it. I think the best book is um, uh, The Postmodern Condition by mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lyotard, the French writer, who, 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 who sort of completely predicts what will happen happen in a world of digital storage, and his his big point is um, that knowledge will become information, mm -hmm. and that certainly made a big impression on me as uh, all this was developing. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a bit about the so to say theoretical, um, not so much underpinning, but let's see what what uh, some of the writings that kind of relate to your work. Um, and I, I would love to kind of hear a bit more from you. Of course, I mean, and we spoke about that often, like certainly uh, Foucault and of course his, his very important uh, uh, writing on uh, Surveillant Pionier, so um, uh, um, it's called in English, uh, um, Surveillance and, and Punishment. Uh, it, that's of course, extremely important uh, for, for your work, uh, but is that something that you kind of saw before and the work came out of it, or did you, basically did you see, have you developed this work and then suddenly you saw someone writing exactly that something that you have expressed in a different way, visually, where there's a kind of a whole theoretical uh, body that basically relates to it, because of course it's something that uh, has been so influential in the time and for architecture, for, for theoretical thinking and art. Well, m most of what I read came after the after, paintings. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I think in the late 70s or around 1980, I, I tried to read Discipline and Punishment. And <laughs> the book begins uh, with a description of uh, the killing of a regicide, which consisted of taking the man and tying his limbs to four horses mm -hmm. and pulling them apart. So I put the book down <laughs> and I said, I'm not gonna read this. <laughs> and, but only when I began to think of the squares as, as prisons and became interested in the idea of surveillance and compartmentalization, et cetera, et cetera, did I really get interested in Foucault. And uh, I always like to tell people that I could never read Derrida, I just couldn't make head or tail of it. Essentially, the writers I was interested in were writing about space. And I do think of Michel Foucault and Virilio and a few others as these great, uh, as developing these their subject matter is, is actually space. Mm -hmm. He talks about the space of medicine, the space of the prison, the space of other institutions, heterotopias, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. self-contained spaces, et cetera, et cetera. But does, that must have been kind of almost like a, not so much a liberating moment, but such a moment where you, you've developed a body of work that was unique and visionary and then suddenly you, you then reading 
so this is a broader context kind of that supports each other. So, so to see when you started uh, at the beginning out of a spirit almost like of isolation, probably even intellectual isolation, uh, if you think about the early 80s, and uh, then you, uh, you, you sense the kind of a, like a theoretical kind of broad, uh, broad embrace that your, your work uh, is part of uh, or can resonate so powerfully. Yeah. Well, I, I've come to feel that writers or philosophers or critics don't think anything up. Mm -hmm. What they do is put into words right. things that are going around. And that certainly happened in the early 80s. And uh, the other aspect of it is I had a fairly traditional college education, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, university education, at least in the United States, was pretty much still oriented around a kind of uh, mid-century humanism and uh, French post-structuralism and the Frankfurt School. And this was happening all over the United States in every field and in Europe as well. It was really the moment at which the edifice of uh, utopian humanism crumbled. And um, uh, I don't like the word postmodernism, but a postmodernist spirit developed in which artists, architects, musicians, uh, designers um, were were taking uh, taking twentieth century modernism and taking those utopian ideas and basically critiquing them. Mm -hmm. If we look at, I mean, of course, this is at the beginning of your, uh, of, so to say, a whole development of, of paintings um, that kind of uh, then uh, went into a kind of, uh, we, we talked about this being kind of the more austere, uh, probably darker beginning, and then it kind of, with, with not only with the idea of the conduits and, and the cells getting uh, connected, but actually also the, you had a certain, like in the introduction of color, especially also the day glow colors and the Rolotex application. Of course, the, 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 your work, your paintings became more hypercharged, I would say, or kind of more, more outspoken even, or, or, or maybe more, more accessible even for, for some. But still, it's a, it is a fairly reduced vocabulary that you work with. Um, and uh, I think that's part of the, of course, the fascination uh, of it that many people have is that you kind of basically can use the, yeah, you have the cell, you have the, the grid, you have the, the conduit, uh, you have the different kind of way of uh, arrangement of that. Um, it's a very rigid system that you put yourself into uh, uh, that you kind of almost like co confined yourself as well, um, and I know you, I mean since we've we've worked also I mean it can go in different dimensions. It become can become three dimensional. It can be also uh, film and video, uh, but still it's it's kind of a very rigid way of uh, of uh, working over the over decades. Um, so can you maybe kind of uh, expand a bit on that? How how, how you? Well, that's a great <laughs> yeah. question because. Yeah. Uh, on one hand, I, I wouldn't say I confine myself yeah. to those elements, but that we're, we're all confined by those elements. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I honestly believe that the nature of space and information and communication in our society follows mm -hmm. that spatial pattern. Uh, compartmentalized spaces where we're often physically alone connected to each other by conduits or pathways that we don't make up or determine, but are determined by corporations, et cetera, and technological developments, et cetera. The other aspect of that is, um, um, I, di I didn't s set out to uh, work with such a confined vocabulary at first, but I did come of age in the 70s as an artist, and many, many of the artists I most admired were involved with what I've begun to call a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to use Dan Flavin as an example. 
So Dan Flavin, let's imagine, one day gets this stupid idea to make sculptures out of fluorescent lights. Completely absurdist. It makes makes what I do look <laughs> positively sensible. <laughs> and over a period of 20 or 30 years, he builds on that unlikely thought experiment. And there are many others. We could talk about Agnes Martin or... or uh, 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 I'm trying to think of um, Salawit. Uh, I thought of all the, that approach to artwork as based on thought experiments. Frankly, right now, I don't think too many artists uh, uh, use that as a generating principle of their work. But, but I'm still very much in favor of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And. Uh, it both has the, abs the aspect of absurdism and uh, also that of almost like uh, the term comes from science, a scientific experiment to see what happens mm -hmm. if you keep using those uh, fluorescent light bulbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Since we see here in this, this presentation, uh, which which one doesn't actually that often see your drawings, um, and they are. Uh, I mean, I think they are, of course, uh, very important to to understand also your working process, but actually also a certain level of experimentation. Can you talk a little bit about the process of the drawings uh, and in relation to the paintings? And when we when we did the, the show in in Frankfurt, actually, uh, we did uh, an installation that was just one painting, actually from uh, 1986. Uh, a whole series of drawings that we put in, and then one massive uh, installation in the rotunda. So, in a sense, sense, we kind of try to uh, so show the, the different media of your work. So, can you talk a bit about the, the drawings uh, and how they kind of in this in this room relate to the, to the paintings as well? well? Well, actually, let me just yeah. mention one other thing. Not, I didn't use too many of these drawings, but I had actually digitized my notebooks and um, uh, blowing up the scale of the drawings. And uh, uh, the Schoen also has these circular uh, galleries with, where you hang work around uh, the outside walls of the circle. And so it became a circular installation of, of uh, digitally transformed drawings, mm -hmm. almost as if to form a hieroglyphic. Uh, most of these are studies for paintings. Um, fourth from the left on the bottom is, I'm sure it's that painting, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe the one above. And there's a certain obsessiveness. Uh, you know, I would draw things again and again to try to uh, work out exactly uh, what I wanted, uh, wanted the painting to look like. Uh, second from the right, is uh, that painting. Um, some of them are more conceptual. Um, uh, the one on the top row, second from the left, um, is three apartment buildings. I'm going to have to go over there. <laughs> uh, cars on the road, airplane travel. And th this is like sort of like thinking out loud. And um, um, this is just a bit absurd, these different buildings. For some reason, it's in Spanish. Casa de las Vente Cinco Ventanas, <laughs> House of the Twenty Windows, House of the Three Windows. <laughs> so when you're 26, 27 years old, <laughs> staying up late at night. <laughs> That's what you come up with. <laughs> I think before I um, want to open up if there are any questions also uh, from the audience, I, w I would love to um, hear you a bit about um, how you, obviously you have been um, someone who closely observed the, so to say, the the merging of the so to say, 
cultural world, the digital world, the social world, and how that uh, connects. Just out of sheer interest, I'm not saying it's kind of always uh, a direct reflection in your, your paintings, but it, you've, you've seen that, um, and, and also, uh, if I also think of Index Magazine, where you kind of really also broaden the idea of what, how culture manifests itself in many different ways, um, which basically, I think, of course, led, led the way to uh, also other, uh, other developments that we see right now. When you are right now looking at the development, not only of social media, but of course what's now, if you look at artificial intelligence and ChatGPT and everything else, I, mean, I know that you are, of course, interestedly looking at that. Um, and on the other hand, uh, um, you might be even like, so to see, opposed to the, so to see, just use of imagery in a different, uh, for, of some kind in a, in a different way. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, where, where you feel right now as an artist in, in this environment, or you as Peter Halley, as someone who, so to see, uh, on the one hand, has a, whose work is being seen as a visionary uh, kind of seismographic uh, work that kind of sh showed a certain development, and now we are, we, are, we are in the midst of an even more complex, but still, uh, but very defined grid of uh, action and reaction. Uh, uh, well, I often refer to my work as a digital 1.0, and uh, my formative years were the uh, uh, first decades of the digital era. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the uh, core concern of my work still seems to be the um, spatial infrastructure of the digital world. So it's not so much social media. Uh, there's an artist I admire very much, uh, Andrew Kuo, uh, who I've talked to a bit. I call his work Digital 2.0, because it's all about big data and, um, um, uh, and uh, social media and the, the persona people might create in social media. Mm -hmm. So there are other artists working on that direction, but I think inherently I'm interested in the structure of space, uh, as, as you know, I'm a big architecture fan as well, and so that, that's, uh, 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 that, that, that's still at the core of my work, uh, uh, unlike some of some younger artists working today who are more focused on the uh, social ramifications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions that anyone are there? Yes, please. Um, I'm curious about your scale that's interested in done these two black paintings. You know, looking at them, the, the bricks are almost like, like the literal size, you know, eight by sixteen, but yeah, it's curious about both the internal dimension and the overall scale of your problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, I was interested in literal scale and I as a New Yorker I was also re engaging uh, with abstract expressionism and New York abstract painting. Uh, the background of that painting was supposed to have a kind of Rothko feeling, <laughs> right. and uh, I originally described it as a walled up Rothko. If Rothko creates a transcendental space, I'm saying, well, <laughs> I'm going to wall that up. And um, this is one of the first examples, well, the first example of my use of rolled on Rolatex. And that was meant as a bit of a uh, joke as well, because uh, in, if you came to New York as an artist in 1980, I think you would, might say to yourself, every artist has his or her characteristic surface or fracture, like a, a, a Rothko is very thin or uh, or uh, 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 somebody else's painting might be really built up, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought I could mechanize mm -hmm. <laughs> the process of uh, creating a character, characteristic or signature uh, surface. Uh, the other thing that I remember sort of fondly about the mid 80s is uh, uh, I, I, I like artistic debate, mm. and uh, part of what I was doing is um, 
uh, critiquing or even with a sense of parody, uh, uh, critiquing the idea of abstraction or geometric abstraction as being inherently spiritual. Mm. And there were a lot of people invested in that idea. And in, in all fairness, it's a perfectly valid idea. But I wanted to take the other point of view that, that it's socially based, that, that, that uh, the subject of abstraction or, or, uh, or art in general should or could be the, the, uh, the social sphere that we live in. And so, if, if, I think there was real debate. I mean, people who believed in uh, the, the inherent spirituality of abstraction did not like what I was doing. Mm. And I, in turn, not on a personal level, but I was, uh, as one might in pol politics, attacking their beliefs. Mm -hmm. There was one question, yeah. What was that last part? how the work from architecture came and some of your recent projects into the actual gallery physical space. When you use wallpaper, so three-dimensional, yeah. Well, I've been building installations and um, uh, reconfiguring spaces to make installations. Um, uh, I've never had any urge to uh, create anything as an architect, but the um, impulse to reorder existing spaces, to create spaces within spaces, uh, is something I, that's become part of my work. Mm -hmm. One more question. Yeah, yeah. I know that as you go further into, Um, well, uh, 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 this is Sam Messer, who is an artist and my colleague at Yale for many years, and um, I, I'm going to forget to mention a bunch of people, but Heim Steinbeck is also here. One little aside I'd like to make is I only came to New York in 1980, when things were getting a little better, uh, but the the artists who made a real impact with the pictures generation and the, the innovative work that was uh, done between 75 and 80, who had the courage to move here <laughs> at that time when New York had just gone through bankruptcy, bravo. <laughs> but these paintings still reflect part of that. Now, Sam, what I've been thinking is, um, Uh, chat AI is a large language model. Personally, I think creativity, as we experience it, is not really creativity, it's expressivity. And I think the um, core uh, impulse behind that creativity is our mortality in one way or another. I think, I, I think if we were all going to live forever, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't make any paintings or mm -hmm. make any art. So, uh, so what, uh, 
what digital systems do, I think, is essentially different than what we do as uh, uh, as mortal biologically based entities. Mm -hmm. That's one one last question. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, you know, I've always been interested in map views, and um, in some of my early paintings, it was supposed to be ambiguous whether you were seeing it in plan or in section. And um, way back in 1980, um, uh, satellite photos were still top secret they weren't available to the public. And so when Google started, Google Earth, Google Maps, stuff like that, where you could look down anywhere in the, in the world and for free, it, it, it was just crazy interesting to me. And uh, as a pastime, and, and when Instagram came along, I, I thought it was, uh, a, a great thing to look into. The other part about it was I had heard that if you posted something on Instagram, uh, Facebook owned it. So I thought it was funny to give Facebook something that Google owned <laughs> rather than that I owned so that they could have a lawsuit. <laughs> All right. Uh, that shows again how your deepest side of this. That's fantastic to hear. Well, thank. Oh, Anders. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, Peter, I love the red paint on the side of that. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> it's a hand print. Yeah. 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 Yeah.